Hello, and welcome to HIPAA staff training for 2019. My name is Michael McCoy, and I will be your instructor today. There's been lots of updated guidance to the HIPAA privacy, security, and breach notification rules. We're going to catch you up today. This training is not legal advice, and I am not an attorney. However, we take the information directly from the Office for Civil Rights, who enforces HIPAA, and other HHS, or Health and Human Service agencies. There's also a lot of information now put out by the Department of Homeland Security and NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. HIPAA is federal law. It is enforced by Health and Human Services, Office for Civil Rights. HIPAA can also be enforced by your state attorney generals. When it comes down to it, HIPAA is about protecting privacy rights of your patients. Remember, you're a patient. You want your rights protected as well. You show your HIPAA compliance through documentation. If it's not documented, it's not done. HIPAA protects PHI, protected health information. Protected health information can be in oral, written, or electronic form. Protected health information is a combination of two factors. First, an identifier. There are 18 HIPAA different identifiers. Then combined with TP or O, treatment, payment or health care operations information. Sensitive protected health information or SPHI is a breach that if occurred could cause the patient financial, reputational or emotional harm. Examples of sensitive protected health information include psychotherapy notes, information about AIDS or HIV testing, whether that testing was positive or negative, information about substance abuse, child abuse, and neglect. Those are all examples of sensitive protected health information. HIPAA allows for three different types of disclosures. First, required. That is to Health and Human Services and their agencies, which include the Office for Civil Rights, CMS, and the Office of the Inspector General. In this case, though, it does not include law enforcement. There are special laws under HIPAA when you can give law enforcement their medical records and when you are going to require a court subpoena. Please refer to the law enforcement blue sheet. It is permitted under HIPAA for you to share medical records between covered entities for continuity of care. That is a big misunderstanding. Do understand that if the disclosure is for continuity of care, you can disclose the records. You are also permitted to give your medical records to your business associate as long as a valid business associate agreement is in place before any disclosures take place. The last type of disclosure is the authorized disclosure. That is where the patient would like the records to go to themselves or they can direct them to another party. Patients have a right to receive the entire designated record set that you maintain on them. For an authorization form to be legal, it must contain nine elements. So make sure that your authorization form and the authorization forms you receive contain those nine requirements. Subpoena request. Subpoena requests either require an authorization or a notice of production. Make sure that if the authorization request is attached, that it contains all of the nine required elements. A notice of production is the opposing attorney notifying you that they have notified the patient through the court and that the patient has not objected. They have waited the required time, so therefore you can release those records without an authorization form. If you have a court order, something that is signed by the judge, follow the instructions exactly. The minimum necessary standard is the heart of HIPAA. Your practice or organization must use reasonable efforts in using, disclosing, or requesting only the minimum amount of protected health information needed for its medically intended purpose. If you don't need the whole chart, don't ask for the whole chart. The minimum necessary standard requires that you follow the same procedures that a patient would in accessing your medical records. So just because you have access does not give you the right to access. That means even your own chart, and especially 
family and friends charts or other charts where you have no medical reason to be going in there. If again, if you want to access your own records or family and friends records who you are on the confidentiality list, you must make sure to follow the same procedures as a patient. Violations may be grounds for your dismissal. The HIPAA privacy rule gives patients certain rights. You're a patient somewhere. We want you to understand these are your rights as well. We're going to go over each of these individually and talk about the updated guidance put out by the Office for Civil Rights. That way, you and your office will be up to date with getting patients copies of their records and responding to requests for any of these rights. My first right as a patient is my right to access or get copies of my medical records. This right has been updated by the Office for Civil Rights and we strongly recommend that you review the full access guidance in the reference materials. A patient now has a right to the entire designated record set, which means all of the records you maintain on that patient, whether they are from your office or from another office. Before, we always stated we're only going to give you the records our office created. That no longer applies. You may charge for medical records, but the Office for Civil Rights and their access guidance put out three methods that you may use. No longer are you allowed to use the state allowable rates unless they're less than these new rates. So the three methods for determining your medical records cost. One, your actual cost taking into account the labor, the toner, and the paper used. For most practices, that will be 25 cents or less. Number two, you can charge a flat fee. That is $6.50 and must include postage. Number three is to average your cost in producing these records. Many of the costs you may think that you can add to these average costs or to the actual cost are not allowed, Again, please reference the access guidance. To reduce burdens and delays in patients getting access to the medical records, HIPAA now requires us to verify patients over the phone. Have good, reasonable steps in verifying the patient's identity using things such as their date of birth, home address, and maybe the last four of their driver's license number. Patients have a right to request access to their medical records in whatever digital format you have the capability of producing. This may include writing to a CD or putting records on a thumb drive. Remember that thumb drives are dangerous. Do not put an unknown USB device into your computer, even if it is from your patient. You will have to purchase a thumb drive, place the records on it, and sell it back to your patient. Email is a digital format and the Office for Civil Rights Guidance expects that all practices should have access to email. So if a patient requests their records to be emailed, we must comply with that. There are two methods. First, we can use encryption. Encryption is a special type of lock that when the file is sent over the internet, it cannot be read by others. In many cases, you will not want to send encrypted email to patients because it may take them a long time to figure out how or because they don't want to set up an account so that they can access the email. In this case, we can send an email to the patients after giving them a light warning. That warning must state that these records could be seen or intercepted as they travel over the internet and when they are in that person's email box. We have a form that you can copy and paste the general disclaimer onto the email. You cannot make the patient come in and sign because again, that could cause an unnecessary burden or delay. So patients do have a right to get their records emailed directly to the patient. We must include that light warning or it must be encrypted. A quick reminder, any email sent other than to the patient with that light warning must be encrypted, no exemptions. Your practice owns the medical records, but the patient has a right to direct them to any other person or entity of their choice. 
make sure you have a signed authorization form confirming that request. In addition to getting copies of their medical records, patients also have a right to access their medical records directly on your computer system. The guidance states that you must have a workstation available and allow them to take pictures of their medical records should they desire. In the access guidance released by the Office for Civil Rights, they pointed out a few things that you may not require your patients to do. One is to use your web portal for accessing the information that the patient wants. It may be a burden to that patient. Also, you cannot mail a request for the access, that authorization or medical records release form, because again, that could cause a delay in them getting their medical records. The HIPAA regulations give your office up to 30 days to respond to a patient's request for access or copies of their medical records. However, the Office for Civil Rights, especially with electronic medical records in place, expects that access to be granted much faster, and they strongly encourage that. You can deny access based on the fact that it is likely to endanger the life or physical safety of the individual or another person. Again, review the access guidance on when you can and cannot deny access to a patient. Patients have a right to request that you amend their record if they feel that there is inaccurate or incomplete information. If you agree with the request, then you need to amend the record. We can never correct a record once it's been signed off by the physician and let any interested parties know. If you deny the request, HIPAA requires that you send the patient a letter stating the reasons for the denial and allow them to put in a brief statement of disagreement. HIPAA is designed to allow you to have access to your patients to provide good health care and calling patients with appointment reminders and letting them know that test results are in is allowed under HIPAA. However, patients have a right to request confidential communications. So if a patient would prefer that you call or send any information to a different phone number or address, we must accommodate those requests as long as they're reasonable. HIPAA gives patients a right to request an accounting of disclosures. This disclosure form must go back for a period of six years. Examples of disclosures that you'd have to make are state-mandated reporting or court subpoenas. Also, any breach or disclosures outside of a need to know would be disclosable to the patient. You do not have to keep an accounting of disclosures for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. Patients have a right to receive a notice of privacy practices that is implemented by your practice or organization. It must be given to the patient no later than the first service encounter it must be posted in your lobby and also on your website if you have a website. In emergency situations, you can give the notice as soon as is practical under the circumstances. Make sure that your notice of privacy practices meets the required elements and that it posts that the patient has a right to complain with your office or the Office for Civil Rights. The most common way for a practice to be audited or investigated by the Office for Civil Rights is for a patient to file a privacy complaint. We can head that off by making sure that patients understand we have an internal process for them to file a complaint with our office. Make sure you understand and know how to get to a request to file a complaint form that you can give to the patient or inform them that you will fill it out and get it to your HIPAA compliance officer. Otherwise, they are likely to go to the Office for Civil Rights web portal and start an investigation of your practice. HIPAA gives patient the ability to restrict the use or disclosure of their PHI upon their request. This also accounts for information to their insurance plan, as long as it's not Medicare or Medicaid, for which the individual has paid out of pocket. The thinking here is, that the insurance company does not need to know about it if the patient has paid in full. Patients have a right to request restrictions of PHI that you could normally give out, such as the patient's general condition, 
or location. A covered entity is not obligated to meet these requests, but if you do agree, then you must abide by your decision. There is a lot of confusion around communicating with family, friends, and others involved in the patient's care. We highly recommend that you read the companion piece, Communicating with Family and Friends, written by the Office for Civil Rights. So HIPAA does give you a right to discuss and share patient information as long as the patient does not object. And you can use your professional judgment to make this determination. Or you could ask permission. So as long as the patient has an opportunity to object, you may share that information with family and friends. If the patient objects, we must review that request. HIPAA allows for healthcare professionals to share health information with a patient's family and friends in an emergency or dangerous situation. The Office for Civil Rights gave the following example. A provider may use professional judgment to talk to the parents of someone incapacitated by an opioid overdose about the overdose and related medical information but generally could not share medical information unrelated to the overdose without the patient's permission. Remember, when a patient does re-reach the level of capacity, you must ask their permission when talking with family and friends and give them an opportunity to agree or object before sharing additional health information. Other examples given by the Office for Civil Rights for when you may talk to a patient's family and friends, even when they're not on that confidentiality list, include the following. An emergency room doctor may discuss your treatment in front of your friend when you ask that friend to come into the treatment room. The hospital may discuss your bill with your daughter who is at the hospital and has questions about the charges. Your doctor may talk to your sister who is driving you home from the hospital about keeping your foot raised during the ride home. It is important to always remember that we can only discuss with that person the information that they are directly involved with with that patient. The HIPAA security rule provides for a basic level of security that is required by all covered entities and business associates. The security rule gives us the policies and procedures that we must implement in our offices. Examples of those policies and procedures include everyone having a unique user ID, using complex passwords, making sure that all systems that connect to protected health information automatically log off after a period of inactivity. And yes, HIPAA training is more important now than ever. The HIPAA security rules basic protections are important because cyber criminals are targeting medical records. They can turn the records you have access to on a daily basis into money. They do this through IRS refund fraud, Medicare fraud, credit card fraud, and even medical identity theft. A report just showed that the average person would incur $2,528 in expense to clear themselves after a medical identity incident. As important as the security rules basic protections are, you must understand that the security countermeasures taken by your office are only a part of what needs to happen. Your behavior as an employee with direct access to the systems is critical and why we must all follow a culture of compliance, thinking security first. At work and at home, we all need to be thinking more about cybersecurity awareness. Things such as making sure that you think twice before clicking on an email attachment. And never disable your security controls, such as turning off antivirus or firewalls. Do not install programs onto your computer unless they've been approved. This goes for screensavers. And cell phones pose a big risk to your practice. Never plug your USB cable into your phone from your computer as it turns into a big thumb drive and could unleash harmful programs onto your network. HIPAA requires 
the physical security of our PHI as well. Make sure that if you are using any charts, forms, faxes, or other information containing PHI, that if you're not using it, it's placed face down on your desk. When you leave your workstation, pressing Control L will lock it. And be careful with paper records. Make sure that if they're going to be thrown away, that we put them in the shred bin or shredder, not in the trash bin. Especially things such as post-it notes, where we take these notes and then don't think of that as PHI. If it has patient information, put it in the proper place. Always clear your work area before leaving for a break. And again, make sure that any forms or other patient information is placed face down. If you can, lock your area before leaving. There are three critical security protections all office members must employ. First, using complex passwords and changing them every 90 days. That's not just for your EHR, but also access to your Windows or other operating system. So just getting on the computer must use a complex password. Email. Cannot overemphasize if the email has an attachment or a hyperlink, you need to double check it. Do not open any email for which you are unsure of whether this person is the person stating who they are in the email. And number three, understand that going to websites not approved by your practice, not used for work purposes, is an extreme danger to your entire organization. Complex passwords are a must. I know that they're a pain. I know that we try to get around them. But you must understand that one of the most common methods of cyber intrusion is through what's called a brute force attack, where you are not using a complex password. This allows for the cyber criminals to use common methods to identify your password and gain access to your network. So a complex password. It is now 10 characters in length, upper and lower case letters, two numbers, and a symbol. This will give you the password security and strength to keep a brute force attack from being successful. I know that they're difficult to make, so we have information in our HIPAA essentials for you to read and review. I like using song titles and my two rules. I capitalize every fourth letter. I turn every A into a question mark. I have the two numbers that I use and therefore I can come up with good complex passwords that are easy to remember. If you're using a non-complex password, you think it's unique and nobody will guess it. Well, the truth is 98.8% .8 of all users not using a complex password will have their password in the top 100,000. These are researched by our universities and the cyber criminals build special software programs that try these 100,000 passwords first. In fact, we're so lazy with passwords that almost 5% of us uses the password, password. So make sure your password is complex and change it every 90 days. You will protect yourself and your practice. Do not cross your passwords. Use different passwords for work and different passwords for home. That way, if one password gets compromised, you can protect yourself and your practice by not sharing and using the same password for everything. Changing your passwords every 90 days is an important security practice. Even better, change your username and password. Understand that as safe as you may be with your username and password at protecting it, it may be compromised from some website or business that you have used it. Use this website, Have I Been Pwned? Don't go at work, but go at home and you can put in your personal and work email addresses and see if the cyber criminals have compromised them and have your username and password. The most common method that a cyber criminal uses to gain access to your network is to trick you with an email that has an attachment or a hyperlink. So when you get emails with attachments or hyperlinks, stop. Did I solicit this email? Am I expecting this email? If not, most likely it's safer not to open the email attachment or click on the link. Double check the return email address. Put your mouse cursor over the return email address and a dialog box will pop up with the actual email address. 
If those two email addresses do not match, you know that that is probably not a safe email to open. A lot of emails coming today are impersonation emails. They look like they're coming as an invoice or a request to be paid. So understand that if you are not the person that deals with the vendor and you received an email from them, forward it to the proper person in your practice that does deal with that vendor. Again, be very safe. Stop and slow down if the email has an attachment or a hyperlink and don't open it unless you're 100% sure. Cyber criminals have tools that can infect websites, even legitimate websites that you may need for work purposes. So the rule here, make sure we only use the internet for work purposes and close out the browser when we're done. Don't leave an open browser because that's an easier access point for the cyber criminal. Never open your own personal email through your work computer. It is too dangerous. There's an estimated 200 to 300 emails in that inbox that could infect your network and cause the loss of all of your patient records. So be very careful when using the web, only use it for work purposes. The HIPAA security rule requires our office to be proactive in looking for unusual or suspicious activity. The EMR creates a user audit trail that must be reviewed on a monthly basis for each employee that goes over what access you did what times you were accessing the network, and what you did while you were accessing those medical records. We're not looking for a bad employee here. We're looking for somebody's credentials to have been compromised. So please understand you are being monitored by your practice. It is a HIPAA requirement. HIPAA defines mobile devices as cell phones or tablets. If you create, receive, maintain, or store patient information over your mobile device, you must read, implement, and sign your practice's mobile device policy. The mobile device policy will require that you lock your device using a six digit or longer PIN number or password, or use biometric, fingerprint, or facial recognition. Your device must also be enabled to wipe after 10 failed password attempts are put in. You also wanna ensure that remote wiping is enabled. Change the default settings. Mobile devices come with settings set to make it easy, not for security. So go through your device settings and make sure that they are set to the maximum security for your device. Disable connectivity to unsecure Wi-Fi. Never use public Wi-Fi on a mobile device where you're also accessing, storing, or retrieving patient records. And look into antivirus, anti-malware for your mobile device as well. Other mobile device security requirements, including requiring the device to automatically lock and making sure that you install security patches and updates as they become available. Again, only use secure Wi-Fi connections. Do not use public Wi-Fi. Always assume if you're on public Wi-Fi that you are being monitored and make sure you only download and put apps on that device that are approved through the Apple Store, Google Store, or other trusted source. Over the past few years, cyber criminals are using a new malicious software called ransomware. It's targeted at healthcare because it locks up your patient records and demands a ransom for the key to open up those records. To aid your organization, in preventing ransomware and other malicious malware attacks, you must always practice good healthcare cybersecurity hygiene. These precautions include never disabling your antivirus or anti-malware software. If a dialog box comes up on your computer to do an update for something like Adobe or Java, make sure you get with IT or Go to the Adobe or Java website directly. Do not click on the dialog box to update their software programs. Never surf the internet and for anything other than work purposes. And again, do not check your own personal email from office computers. Always think twice before you click. Remember that email is the most popular method for cyber criminals to intrude or infect your network. 
So again, double check the return email address. Check it to the actual letter. And again, if you are not familiar with the person sending it or expecting an email with an attachment to come to your computer, do not click on it. Cyber criminals have developed very intricate methods to take advantage of your good human nature. You must defeat your natural inclination to trust and to want to be helpful. It's called social engineering. And social engineering is really just the con man for the digital age. Social engineers use the following deception methods. One, authority. If I call you right now as Dr. Michael McCoy, there's a good chance that you're going to treat me as a doctor, not knowing who the person on the other end of the line truly is. Likeability. We tend to share information with people we like. That information may be what the cyber criminal needs to gain access to your network. Reciprocation. Somebody gives us something, we have a natural inclination to want to return that favor, even if it's just a compliment. Consistency. We like to stay constant with our stated values and what we've said in the past. Validation. I know that others are doing it, so I can do it as well. Scarcity. This is a limited time offer. You need to act right now. Be aware that the cyber criminals are out there and that they're doing their best to use these deception methods to trick you into giving them information or access to your network. Social engineers like to use fear, curiosity, or sympathy when trying to get you to click on their link. Also remember, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Using the word free is bound to draw attention and understand that you did not win a $50 Amazon gift card. Other social engineer attacks include clickbait. Something I saw, I want you to check out, click this. Here's that cute kitty, click this. Watering hole, getting you to go to that infected website. Also, telling you that you can avoid legal troubles by paying a fine. Usually it looks like it's coming from the US Department of Justice or the FBI Cybercrime Division. Also, be very careful of phishing tools that look like they're coming from your bank or hospital. All of these require that we use common sense to make sure that we are protecting ourselves and our patient records. Use common sense to avoid social engineering traps. Trust your gut feeling. If it feels too good to be true, it probably is. If you feel something is off, it probably is. Stop and think about what you're being asked to do. Hey, by the way, how did you get my phone number? How did you get my email address? I don't know who you are. Good healthcare cybersecurity hygiene requires that we always be on alert, looking for signs that we may have been infected. One of those is maybe we can't find files that we knew were on our system or the computer has noticeably slowed down. Realization that a link or a file attached opened may have been malicious in nature. If you feel that your computer has been compromised or you clicked on a link that you should not have, first thing, disconnect the power to your computer. Next, remove the network cable. If you're unsure about which cable this is, just unplug all of them. Notify your supervisor immediately and alert the other staff members. You should always, when you feel that there is a security incident, change your password and tell everybody else to change their passwords as well. You can also call law enforcement or notify them at the information on this slide. I wanna move our attention to Medicare fraud and abuse. Medicare fraud is defined as knowingly submitting false statements or making misrepresentations of fact to obtain federal health care payment for which no entitlement would otherwise exist. Knowingly soliciting, paying, or accepting money to induce or reward referrals for services. Making prohibited referrals for certain designated health services. We do not participate in Medicare fraud and want you to report anything that you feel could be fraud to your supervisor immediately. 
Medicare abuse is defined as the practice either directly or indirectly causing unnecessary costs to be billed to the Medicare program. Abuse includes not providing what is medically necessary for the patient or billing an unfair price. Medicare fraud and abuse includes the following federal laws, the False Claims Act, the Anti-Kickback Statute, Physician Self-Referral Law, the Social Security Act, and the United States Criminal Code. When it comes to Medicare fraud and abuse, our organization wants to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Make sure to bring any suspected fraud or abuse claims to your supervisor or physician immediately. The last topic of today is going to be a breach. Breaches will occur in all offices and organizations. A breach is generally where we have violated the patient's rights because we sent, used, or disclosed patient information to somewhere other than it where it was medically necessary. Common breach would be we fax something to the wrong physician's office. All breaches must be reported. Other breaches that we must document are things such as PHI going to the wrong requester, giving PHI without an authorization by the patient. Many times we hear of inappropriate disclosures to the employer. Make sure you understand that just because the employer may carry the insurance doesn't mean they get a copy of the patient's medical records. Identity theft, stealing and disclosing PHI, Inappropriate access. Again, look at the minimum necessary standards. Federal law requires that every breach or suspected breach have a breach risk assessment performed. There are four critical questions to the breach form. One, what was that PHI that was involved? We want to know the identifiers, payment, treatment, or health care operations information that was involved. Who is the person that the information was breached to? Was it another doctor's office? Was it another patient? Or did it go to someone outside of that community? Was the PHI viewed or acquired? Typically, if you're filling out this form, you're going to know that, but not always. And how have you mitigated any risk that could come to the patient be as a result of this breach or suspected breach? Document these and give them to your HIPAA compliance officer immediately. Remember that our office has legal requirements, even in the event of a breach you think may be too small to report. So they must be reported to our HIPAA privacy officer and knowing and practicing your policies and procedures will greatly reduce the occurrence of these breaches occurring in the first place. There will be breaches that occur in your office on a daily basis. And as long as your office has adopted reasonable safeguards to minimize these breaches using the minimum necessary standard, they are considered to be incidental use and disclosure. Another patient overhearing another patient's information. A workforce member overhearing patient information and they are not involved in their care. As long as the information that was given was incident to an otherwise permitted use or disclosure, we have incidental use and disclosure. No breach risk assessment is required. When you need to discuss sensitive protected health information in the office, that information that could harm a patient financially, reputationally, or emotionally, follow the following safeguards. Make sure you're behind a closed door and speak in as low a tone of volume as you can. In that case, we still have incidental disclosure because you took the proper safeguards if it gets overheard. Protecting patient privacy is everyone's responsibility. Do what you can to help protect patients from the harm that a breach could cause. You're also maintaining the reputation of your practice. The Office for Civil Rights has announced documentation audits will be ongoing. Make sure that you have the documentation in your office to show that you do comply with HIPAA. If you need a set of documentation, please contact your HIPAA compliance officer. A final reminder, if it's not documented, 
it's not done. Again, we provide a complete set of HIPAA documentation in the HIPAA Compliance Kit. HIPAA should not get in the way of your office providing good health care. If you have any doubts or questions, refer to the guidance materials that we've provided or check with your HIPAA compliance officer, physician, or office manager. I want to thank you for your time and attention today. If you have questions or need further information, please check out the HIPAA Essentials booklet and guidance documents that come with this training. High Tech Compliance Associates is available to help you with all of your HIPAA compliance needs. Please contact us at the information on this slide. Again, we want to thank you for spending this time with us today and feel free to contact us if you have additional questions. Thank you.